I remember getting a length of 6x2 softwood and chopping it up into, and G-clamping it together um, in a kind of cantilever shape and sitting on it. They relate to people in a much more direct way. You're sitting on them, you're touching them the whole time that you're using them, you're in contact with them. I wouldn't have thought the fact that you swivel gives you power and command, but um, I suppose the ability to turn quickly on people could be, could be construed as giving you a sense of authority. The way it balances, the fact that it doesn't have a base, the fact that it is a solid volume, the fact that it's uh, made just out of the skin, there's no skeleton there. I mean, lots of them you can go on. The fact that you, can, you hammer at the comfort, with, you, know, you hammer it, it until it until it gets the right. Hammering a piece of metal to get the comfort right in a chair which is also to come under another hammer, that of the auctioneer, is no more unusual than believing that a chair is an object with four legs on each corner and a flat piece to sit on. This simple object has commanded the attention of mankind for as long as we can remember. There is nothing quite like the chair. It was probably early man who sat on a boulder and turned it around to a more comfortable position, hence starting the humble design profession. Because to the present day, there's clearly no other item of furniture in history that has been so over-designed as the chair. But there's nothing quite like a chair. And as someone recently said about a particular chair, it's a very good chair for sitting. What an obvious remark, you might think, as what else is a chair used for if it's not for sitting on? But throughout history, the chair has not only been regarded as an artifact of service, but much more as an artifact of culture. Remember the story of Goldilocks? First, she sat in the great big chair. It was too hard. Then she tried the middle-sized one, and it was too soft. Finally, she tried the baby chair, but it broke. The horror and indignation of the three bears when they discovered in turn that their chairs had been sat in almost amounted to a personal violation. It illustrated well the importance of the chair. The chair throughout history has been a symbol of culture. It is a mark of personal status and from the earliest regal throne to the current chair of everyday use, it is simply not just an object for sitting on, but it tells the story of society, reflecting the social, economic, and philosophical state of that society. The medieval oak-panelled box chair, a development of the chest, was used for storing personal possessions, and was probably only sat in by the head of the household. Many chairs of this period were folding, not just for storing away, but they reflected the nomadic lifestyle of the people whose households could be plundered at any time by neighboring tribes. The austere leather and brass studded chairs of the Cromwellian period depicted the political climate of an age when many people lived in fear of their lives. Yet, a hundred years later, a chair such as this George II love seat told a very different story, depicting a more graceful social lifestyle. Well, for some. Of course, throughout history, much furniture was for the rich, who presumably had time to sit down. Indeed, from the earliest time, the main influence on chair design came from those who held power, whether it was the church or royalty. And of course, many period styles were named after the monarchs. During the dramatic changes in the last two centuries, 
starting with the Industrial Revolution. The chair has become even more significant as an artefact of culture. And today, this is typified by the use of certain chairs on television, such as the kind of chair used on the Mastermind program. Such a chair symbolizes strength and prestige. Imagine using a deck chair for the same program. It would be totally out of context. But before you conjure up a picture of deck chairs and people wearing sunglasses lazing around on the beach, did you know that Ludwig Wittgenstein, the wartime professor of philosophy at Cambridge University, delivered his lectures from a deck chair? So, the chair is not just for sitting. It enters our very language and is an important element in human interaction. Sitting is something that most people do a lot of every day. The chair is just a functional object for them to do it in, in one sense, uh, and of course to look at. Well, they're not sitting in, or even if they're sitting in this chair, they're looking at that chair. It's got to be a piece of sculpture that's interesting for them to have in the room as well, ideally, uh, because if they've got a set of four, they're only ever sitting in one, and unless they've got three friends around, they've got to be looking at three empty ones. So they've got to be good in both respects. Whether you are looking at chairs or just aware of their existence, they are seldom placed at random, but usually gravitate towards a particular focal point, such as the living room fire, or more likely nowadays, towards the television. Of course, at business meetings, the chairman, or should I say chairman of the board, usually has a special position and probably a special chair. Indeed, one of the highest offices that anyone can hold at a university is the chair. The chair can give status and identity whilst possessing an identity of its own. But what about the chair that has no identity until it is used? This seemingly plain cube of foam rubber is cleverly slit so that when the central portion is depressed or sat upon, it forms a chair. And when the person gets up, it resumes the form of a cube. As a cube, it is not particularly spectacular, and as a chair, there are more comfortable and better looking examples around. But as a concept, it is a good example of true originality, and not least of all, it is amusing. Whereas amusement is a familiar theme in some chairs, and also the shock of the new, there is a more serious thread running through chair design which has prevailed over the centuries. The familiar Windsor chair is a classic design dating back to the early 18th century. The chair was easily and cheaply produced in the Beechwood Forest near High Wycombe. Its simple craft technique of steam bending was also developed in Austria by Tonnet in the early 19th century. At the turn of the century, Tonnet was experimenting with new processes and developed the technique for bending wood. Um, this enabled him to produce a chair that was finely sculpted, that was light, but had enormous strength. And that made it perfect for the application of the time. And it is probably the archetypal Viennese cafe chair. The significance of the Tonnet chair probably springs from the fact that it is, above all else, fit for purpose. Red Blue, funny name for a chair, more the sort of name that you associate, might associate with a, a modernist picture, um, but maybe that's what Ritbelt, the designer of this particular chair, intended because for me it's, um, it's more art than sitting. The chair is three-dimensional art. Another radical chair of its time, which also used straight lines for the first time, is the zigzag chair by Gerrit Rittfeld. A truly original design which began a revolution which continues today, it is deceptively strong and shows Rittfeld's command of materials. Form follows function. 
This was the ideal of a group of German architects and designers who formed the Bauhaus School in the 1920s. New material processes were exploited, such as bending tubular steel, and an important figure was Mies van der Rohe, who achieved this simple cantilever chair, of which countless variations are sold today. The famous Chair Without Back Legs by Marcel Broyer in 1928 has arguably had the most impact as a chair design of this century. In the 1930s, Alvar Aalto of Finland was also exploring bent shapes, but this time in wood. His furniture started the great Scandinavian tradition of wood laminating. In 1952, Harry Batoya's plastic-coated steel rod chair was a playful adventure in space, form and metal. But not all chairs are so visually striking, and their importance is less obvious. This chair by Robin Day, manufactured by Hilly, is one of the most significant pieces of English furniture design um, of the past century. That may well surprise a lot of people, but it truly is a significant chair because for the first time a British manufacturer made a substantial investment in tooling to enable the serial production of a chair that would be very inexpensive. Given a tooling cost of around £50,000, which is certainly in those days was a very substantial investment, it became possible to produce a, a, a seating product that would actually sell at about £3.50. Now that is the genius of the chair, well demonstrated by the fact that millions of them have been used not only in this country but also throughout the world. Well, these are some of the significant chairs of the past hundred years or so, exploiting new materials and technologies, offering a variety of form and function at a low cost. But when asked to pick out just one chair, what was Tony Kitcher's response? Everybody's favourite, the Barcelona chair, designed by Mies van der Rohe for the um, Spanish Exposition in 1936. Um, the Barcelona is truly regarded as the classic chair, simple in form, truly a reflection of the Bauhaus philosophy that less is more. Um, in many senses, it's the critic's chair, but again, to sit in, um, it offers great comfort. A frequently talked about aspect of chair design, comfort. Comfort was probably not uppermost in Danny Lane's mind when he designed this striking chair in the 1980s. It is made of stacked glass and is superbly crafted. Perhaps this one, by English designer Fred Bayer, is comfortable but it's not the sort of chair you're likely to pick up at MFI, Habitat or IKEA for the price of a few rounds of beer. Five thousand. Five thousand pounds on my left. Against you at the back, it's at five thousand pounds on my left. All done then at five thousand pounds. <laughs> One, one, three. The uh, Tom Dixon found object is 200 pounds offered for this. The chair itself um, is made out of sheet steel, which is formed freely in the wor workshop. It was Ron's idea with this particular chair to try and transform a rough sketch. In so if you actually go along to his studio to examine his designs, they are sketches. Rough sketches are not the only things to discover in Ron Arad's London studio. These old car seats are used in one of his earliest and most successful designs, the Rover chair. The critics have difficulty in pigeonholing Arad. Is his work craft? Is it art? Clearly the rolling volume chair has a sculptural quality, but what else is there about it? The way it balances, the fact that it doesn't have a base, the fact that it is a solid volume, the fact that it's uh, made just out of the skin, there's no skeleton there. I mean, lots of them you can go and 
fact that you, you hammered the comfort with you, you hammered it until it until it gets the right lots of people sat on it in the program you call everyone mm -hmm. I mean ask can you take a seat what do you say <laughs> right okay <laughs> and it's, and yeah. Once referred to as a poet of technology, Arad displays a versatile approach to chair design, meeting exacting technical requirements whilst being able to play freely with ideas as he goes along. It started nice, it had nice things about it, the seamless joint here, and very nice relationship between the back and the seat. But then something went wrong here somewhere, so we chopped it and, and recycled it into something else. And it has lots of beginnings of ideas that we haven't used before, like this this thing here. So you get like a line here, you see a line continuing from here, and then that's pinched, and that's like a Chinese hat here. We never had a chair with, to a, of the volume series with a, with a hole in it. This is new for us, and it's uh, we're taking this opportunity of this commission do something for us with you know to be a mascot. You have to get to work. To work, I think, to get it the right color, and you have to know when to stop. So that's going to be in contrast to the to this, which will go back to be mirrored. Finish. I mean, there's a lot of, of polishing to do here. Looking at it now, I don't know if it will be finished today, <laughs> but it, it could be. From the poet of high-tech to a master of low-tech, David Colwell is a chairmaker who works from an old schoolhouse in mid Wales. He's been producing a unique range of chairs since the middle of the 70s. Um, the essence of the, uh, design, all the designs I produce um, is an attempt to um, use a local indigenous material um, to produce a high performance structure, which uh, a chair is, because it's got to be very light and it's got to support your moving load, which is very heavy. My aim in doing these designs has been to produce furniture that has the benefits of um, hand production and craft techniques, plus the benefits that we associate with um, more sophisticated production techniques. The process I'm involved with is steam bending. And in this uh, case, you can see that the components of both these legs and this main back of it, this is built, this is bent on a solid timber. The process involves heating the material in steam, bending it round a mould with a strap on the outside of it to stop it um, stretching, in fact. Um, this process not only gives you a bend, it seasons the timber at the same time. Very, very cost effective. Um, the frame consists of a series of triangles. Um, triangles are inherently stable, whereas rectangles, which is the conventional furniture form, um, have rely on the joints to give them stability. With a triangulated construction, the uh, frame is, the, the, the geometry is inherently stable, irrespective of whether the joints are rigid or not. Now in this particular chair, the joints aren't rigid at all. Um, if you use a triangle, for instance, the triangle that you can see um, contained here, and in effect, that is also a triangle here, it's a slightly formalized one, but uh, structurally it's, it's, its function is a, is a, is a triangle. Um, all these points could be pivots, and in fact this one is a pivot. Um, and it wouldn't make a scrap of difference. The thing has enormous strength. The back of a chair is an important feature, not least of all because it should be comfortable. In Colwell's folding chair, He's resolved the problem of curving the back member, often an expensive operation in chair making, by cleverly steam twisting and bending a flat panel. This feature hints at Colwell's respect for the tradition of Windsor chair making. 
Tradition is a springboard for the ideas of another chair designer, Jeremy Brune, who was first inspired by a classic chair by Hans Wegener of Denmark. A very modern chair for its time. Um, I chose to make one when I was a student at Shortridge College and when I was 17. And I've always regarded him as the craftsman's designer because it was such a delight to um, shape with spoke chain. Not happy with merely copying tradition in the way he was taught, Brune experiments with new forms and structures using whatever technology is available. And his craft background is a useful springboard for designing. I'm sufficiently confident with my material to be able to look at a piece of wood and say, I think that member's got to be four inches deep or one and a half inches deep or whatever to hold the human body you know, in a certain configuration, you know, to be strong enough. My, my ideas usually start as sketches and then probably it's my impatience but it's straight down to the workshop and G clamps and bits mm. of wood and a glue gun and plywood and whatever, nails if necessary to produce a rough idea of what things are going to look like. And because chairs are such three-dimensional objects, I like to walk around this mock-up. Brune is primarily a workshop designer, and a good example of this is the Caterpillar rocking chair, which he first produced in 1984. To quote Simon Yates from an encyclopedia of chairs, this chair is visually stunning, a good combination of colour, structure and practicality and has the advantage of being a truly original idea. Its skeletal plywood form integrates a series of hardwood slats which support the body and achieve the rocking motion. But what isn't original about it is the way the comfort is achieved, especially the lumbar support, as the data is simply copied from an existing comfortable chair. But what is a comfortable chair? Is it necessarily one which you can simply throw yourself into? And is sitting something which we all know how to do? Um, people don't always know how to sit correctly in chairs. They don't always know how to get the best from their um, uh, seated environment. And for that reason, it is um, quite important for people to be instructed in the use of a chair. It's almost as though you need to know how to drive it to get the best from it. Um, adjustments like this for back rake, for example, can be a great material benefit to office workers. But if they don't know where the control is, if they can't locate the button that makes the function work, they're not going to use it. Um, a lot of people tend to think that back support is um, back support as high as you can get it. And you walk into a lot of offices and you find the chairs um, uh, really far too high, all that does is throw you further forward. The support you need when you're sitting in a chair is for the buttocks, and that's quite easy to do. Um, and then, a little more difficult, you need to locate the right area for the lumbar, lumbar region. And if you are correctly seated and the lumbar support is right, then the chances are that you are going to be comfortable. Well, the need for an adjustable chair tends to underline the fact that we all come in different shapes and sizes, and that really, chairs are like shoes. You need them made to measure. This kneeling stool, designed by Jeremy Brune and called the lumberjack, is adjustable in concept. The stool is designed for long and short-legged people, as by rotating it, the body contact points are of two different lengths. But the main concept of kneeling stools is that they arch the back and are a radical approach to the problem of body support, as they fundamentally alter the angle of body alignment. Conventional chairs tend to huddle the body, which arguably causes stress to the invertebral discs and inhibits blood circulation and the function of internal organs. Well, they say that if a designer comes up with a new chair, his reputation is made for a decade. And if it's comfortable, it's a bonus. Are you sitting comfortably?
both usable formally and informally. But in fact, I think it's necessary to opt for one or the other. It's never enough for me to do a chair that's a variation on another chair or just that, that it's a little more elegant than other chairs or... I, to do a new chair you have to have a very good idea to do, a very good reason to do a new chair. It's a wonderfully engineered structure, ideally suited to the circumstances of the time, the forestry requirements and the technical requirements. That There's nothing about a Windsor chair which re requires a high capital investment. Looking at looking to chairs in England in the early 80s, contemporary chairs, um, it was a very sort of experimental time, and a lot of the designers were just throwing chairs together that were very uncomfortable. It's a wonderfully satisfying object to produce, a chair. I can't think of a nicer object to produce, to design, to conceive, to design, and to make. Mies van der Rohe, Corbusier, Rittveld, Eileen Gray, some of the greatest names in the design world have produced chairs and put their individual tag on it. But the great chair, the greatest chair of all, probably still eludes us. It's out there to be done. diameter and you put all the books in the middle of the wheel so that it's only the rim. What is interesting is the huge variety of styles, you know, from really modern to much more classical. That's, that's a really nice thing. We haven't just got a climate problem, we've got a problem with all sorts of other things which are related to the way that we go about things. When you take a, a pack of veneers and bend them, you can bend them around a two-dimensional shape. If you twist them, then you're moving into a third dimension. The idea behind this piece was to, to have it, it's hinting at a, a, a skin of, of black walnut on a core, a pale, very, very square, beautifully crisp. He was entirely self-taught. Um, he never had the, um, the privilege of, of uh, training as an architect. With this chair, I used flat plywood where I created different shapes in the flat but if you can see how, when they're brought together into a three-dimensional form, they actually suit the shape of the back. Much of my inspiration comes from Finland, where wood has provided the food of survival. The other influence I have, and I guess this makes me unusual, is that I chose to work in a furniture factory before I set up on my own. One of the things I like about this table 
is that it's a circle, but instead of using what I call a diffused grain, like a burr, uh, you've used a, a linear grain. Well, they're learning manual skills, and they're learning an important part of our heritage, which is a man's relationship with the woodlands. You know when you telephoned me, what was the actual beading that you were, uh, or the reed? This is the beading we were talking about, which is a very typical feature of Alan's work. There is some amazing work. There's so much quality, creativity, joy, love, passion. It's a fantastic representation of what is going on in the field today.